by it's just going to dissolve in just like sugar and water dissolves and then you transport it that way. These guys, however, because of their chemistry, would, be, would, would kind of coalesce together because that's what fats do in water, right? They would kind of coalesce together in the blood and you wouldn't be able to transport them. So we have to keep them bound to a carrier, right? Kind of think of it, it's not exactly the same chemical process, but, but you remember when we had bile help us emulsify fat to keep it from coming together so we could transport it or digest it or whatever? Kind of the same thing. We need to cover up their chemistry so that they can be transported in blood plasma. So we're always going to have to talk about proteins that carry those there. Half-life. Protein hormones have a short half-life, meaning that they don't stay around a long time. And that's because they're usually made of polypeptides. Polypeptides are these long, they're usually not, it's usually not a, it's usually not a globular protein, rather it's almost as primary structure is how they get, get transport around. So they're floppy molecules and they break. So they break easily. Um, they also are not protected because we don't carry them bound to anything. So they're more likely to be damaged here. On the other hand, steroid hormones, because of their chemistry, they're more stable, if you will, in water, I don't know. And the fact that they're bound to a carrier protein makes them less likely to be degraded as they're being transported. Does that make sense? Or just it's like uh, uh, you're carrying them in something so they're protected. And that gives them a longer half-life. They tend to stay around longer. Because of that, this is going to be, once you start a steroid hormone response, it would take longer to stop it, right? Because they're going to stay around a long time. You release them. It might take you a while to release them, but once they're there, they're going to stay around a while. So we call a, a, a steroid hormone response kind of like slow on, builds up. And when you want to turn it off, it's slow off. It kind of, kind of slowly terminates. These, though, because you can store them and release a large amount at a particular time, boom, wrap it on. Because they have a short half-life, wrap it on. They're also easier to break down. We know, of course, where the receptors are. Pretty obvious. Cell membrane, right, because of their chemistry here. Cytoplasmic here, or nucleus, it says some have membrane receptors also, but let's say this is rare. Because okay. it doesn't make sense, right? It doesn't fit the pattern. Responses, we can activate second messenger systems here. These usually trigger gene expression. Now, if they, if you have a steroid, well, it's just some terminology. If you have a steroid hormone that triggers gene expression, we say that is a genomic effect. Because genome refers to your DNA, right? That's what your genome is, is all your DNA. So most steroid hormones work via a genomic effect. A non-genomic effect is where it affects something other than your DNA. It may ultimately lead to an increase in gene expression, but it is not directly interacting with your DNA. So hydrophilic hormones. Genomic or non-genomic effects? Non Have to be non-genomic effects, right? Most steroid hormones, genomic effects. Some not. I mean, some not have to always be. They could trigger some up. They could activate an enzyme inside the cell as well. But they, they can do genomic effects. Um, yeah, that, that leads to this kind of general target response. What do you get? Modification of existing proteins, right? Uh, because lo a lot of the things we talked about on Wednesday with regard to signals and their responses, <clears throat> we looked at um, uh, the fact that they often activate enzymes. And many of the enzymes they activate were kinases. Remember what a kinase is? What's a kinase? Phosphorylates proteins, right? So by activating a kinase, this kinase will go around and stick phosphates on proteins. And why is that important? Because phosphates are a way to regulate protein action. Oftentimes phosphorylation turns on proteins, makes them active, and dephosphorylation makes them inactive. But there are examples where the, other, the opposite is true as well. Sometimes we phosphorylate, something's active without phosphates, put phosphates on 